Welcome to the fourth webinar in our series on COVID controversies, ethical challenges in research and treatment. I'm Susan Wolf, faculty chair of the University of Minnesota's Consortium on Law and Values in Health, Environment and the Life Sciences, the organizers of this series. Today's webinar tackles a big and controversial issue. Should colleges and universities mandate vaccination for COVID-19? We meet to debate this at a challenging time again in this pandemic. Cases are again on the rise here in Minnesota where I am and across the United States due to the Delta variant. The global challenges remain enormous. CDC Director Rochelle Walensky said just this week, quote, the Delta variant is more aggressive and much more transmissible than previously circulating strains. We are yet at another pivotal moment in this pandemic. Uh, with vaccines against COVID-19 now widely available across the United States, at least, colleges and universities face an important issue. Should they require vaccination for their students and their employees? Uh, roughly, it's been reported about 600 public and private colleges and universities in the US have decided yes, that they're going to require vaccination. Others have decided not to. Earlier this week, we saw a judicial decision from a federal court in Indiana in the case of Klassen versus trustees of Indiana University, upholding that university's vaccine requirement for the fall in the face of a legal challenge by eight students and their application for a preliminary injunction to stop application of that requirement. We've posted that decision and other resources on the website for this webinar for the audience. Uh, today, I'm thrilled that we have three top experts from across the country with different points of view to debate the ethical policy and the legal issues raised by a COVID vaccine requirement in higher ed. Um, they're here to consider the effectiveness of mandates in advancing community health in this setting of uh, colleges and universities, uh, the impact on equity and trust. And uh, I think we're also gonna be talking about the legal basis for vaccine mandates. I do wanna thank the co-sponsors of this event, the Office of the Vice President for Research the Office of Academic and Clinical Affairs and the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, SIDRAP, here at the University of Minnesota. I also want to thank our planning committee. They're listed on our website and very much thank the consortium staff and university video services, without whom you wouldn't be seeing any of us. So thanks to them. Uh, to tweet during this event, Please use hashtag COVID-19 ethics all run together and look for the consortium tweets, which are at UMN Consortium. The webinar is being videotaped and raw video is going to be available on our YouTube channel and our website right after. So you can immediately be looking at that and sharing it. An edited version will be posted within about a week on our website. And all registrants will get an evaluation after we read every single one. So please give us your feedback. We love it. So we are thrilled to have three spectacular speakers today. Professor Lawrence Gostin, who is director of the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law at Georgetown University. Uh, Dr. Michael Osterholm, who's director of SIDRAP here at the University of Minnesota and Dr. Stephen Thomas, who is director of the Center for Health Equity at the University of Maryland. We really could not have a better panel of speakers. I'm gonna introduce each of them in turn. They're each gonna talk for just about 15 minutes to kick things off. 
And then we're gonna open it up and all get on screen for a panel discussion and QA. We already have a lot of questions, but please send us your questions and this is how. You should email your questions to consortm at umn.edu. So that's C-O-N-S-O-R-T-M at umn.edu. We are dying to get your questions. We want all of them. Our staff is already monitoring that account. They're already sending their questions, uh, your questions to me, so keep it going. You can also email that address if you're having any technical difficulties. We have staff here and we wanna solve that so you can be part of this discussion. And finally, on disclosures, I wanna say that all of our speakers and I as moderator have identified no relevant disclosures. So with that, let me turn to introducing our first speaker, Professor Larry Gostin. Professor Gostin is university professor, Linda D. and Thomas J. O'Neill, professor of global health law and professor of medicine at Georgetown University. He's also professor of public health at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he directs, as I said, the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law, as well as the World Health Organization Collaborating Center on National and Global Health Law. Uh, Larry has been really at the center of public policy and law through multiple epidemics from AIDS and SARS, Ebola, MERS, Zika, the list goes on. And he's currently list, uh, working very closely with the Biden administration, as well as global institutions like WHO, World Bank, Gavi on the COVID-19 response. He's a member of the National Academy of, member, uh, of Medicine, the Council on Foreign Relations, a fellow of the Hastings Center. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Larry. Thanks very much, Susan. I won't tell the audience that we've known each other for 40 years, um, that's, that's for sure. Um, and how long have I known you, Mike, maybe 60? <laughs> um, and Steve, same thing. Go, we go back to aid. So we're all we're all really good friends. So you know, I'm going to start with something that I think we all agree on. Um, before before we diverge, um, I think we all agree on that we want to find the best policy that would um, have the highest degree of COVID-19 vaccine coverage in the population, um, whether it's a student population or a, or, or a full uh, university population or our local community or our nation. And so the question really is, um, do mandates or proof of vaccination systems help us get there? I think they can. Um, I'm thinking that Mike, because I know him so well and we've spoken about it, um, will agree with me, but will think that mandates will, will make it less likely. And if he's right, I agree with him. If he's wrong, I don't. Um, and that can't be, I, that, it's an oxymoron because it's, but anyway, here's why. Um, let me just first set the groundwork. Um, you know, we, we talk of proof of vaccination systems and mandates almost in the same breath. And in some ways they're very similar, but in some ways they're not. You know, a mandate is you, you are required to get a vaccine. A proof of vaccination system is, is that you're, acquire, you're required to show proof of whether or not you're vaccinated. Um, and so if you, are, um, if you show proof and you're not vaccinated um, and then you're excluded from that activity, is it a mandate? possibly, but a proof of vaccination system doesn't have to exclude you from that activity. It can require you to do other things that keep you safe, keep the community safe. Um, for example, if you are negative, if, if you um, are not vaccinated, we may ask you to wear a mask where a vaccinated person wouldn't. That would be consistent with CDC guidelines. Um, we might ask you to socially distance, or we might even ask you to learn remotely or work remotely. Uh, and so there are, so we have to understand exactly what we mean by all of these concepts. 
Now, I realize that um, uh, proof of vaccination and mandates are kind of the third rail of politics. Um, they, they get a lot of people uh, very angry on, on both sides. Um, I will say this, that when we've required vaccination as a condition of doing certain things, we tend, I think the evidence shows, to increase the vaccination rate. Um, that was true and it is true with um, school vaccinations, including making religious and other exemptions, uh, mostly religious exemptions and philosophical ones, um, rare. Uh, when Houston Methodist uh, hospital system uh, did a mandate, they now have close to 99% of their population vaccinated. And when we do um, uh, comparisons, for example, with inf influenza in hospitals, we find that those with mandates have considerably higher um, rates of um, vaccination. But I, I agree, it is an empirical question and COVID-19 is not like any other. Let me just talk about a few of the legal uh, technicalities first that I'll turn it over to Mike. Um, you know, the, the, um, uh, the United States uh, has a long history of mandatory vaccinations um, going back to the earliest days of our republic, smallpox and, 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 and onwards. Uh, the Supreme Court has twice upheld it. Um, and so um, it, it's clearly one of the most um, accepted precedents in the country that under the police powers, the um, uh, public health authorities have the, have the right to require um, vaccinations. Uh, it assumes, of course, that the vaccinations are safe and effective. And it also assumes that anyone with a medical um, uh, condition uh, that would be harmed by the vaccine won't have to get the vaccine. They could, they could get an exemption. Um, at the same time, as long as for as long as we've had vaccinations, we've had uh, legal mandates, they've been upheld, but as long as we've had vaccinations, we've had very strong feelings against them. Uh, the anti-vaccination movement goes back a long way in the United States um, and, uh, and globally. Um, there are a couple of reasons why people are uh, against COVID-19 mandates. One of them is that we're currently under an emergency use authorization. I think a lot of the scientific community um, uh, believes that FDA should be acting much more quickly to give uh, particularly the mRNA vaccines uh, a full licensure. Um, but we're acting as if it is a fully licensed vaccine. We're recommending it on a population-based level. We're telling people it's safe, it's effective. We're not acting as if it's an emergency use. So I'd like to see the FDA move on that um, very quickly. Um, there is also a divide in America about, you know, whether or not I have the right to bodily integrity. Um, and you do have the right not to take a medicine or a vaccine to help yourself, that is to make yourself safer and healthier, although COVID vaccines would make you safer and healthier. Um, but you do not have the right to go unmasked and unvaccinated in a crowded classroom. Um, or in a crowded office in a university. And that's why um, Georgetown University has a mandate for uh, faculty, staff, and students and over 500 uh, colleges and universities do. I predict that once the uh, EUA is lifted and this full licensure, we're gonna see a lot more colleges and universities um, uh, doing the same thing. Um, so th thanks. I hope I didn't go over, Susan, and um, I'll turn it over to you. And I think Mike might be next. Thank you, Larry. It was a great job uh, laying the groundwork for us. Our next speaker is Dr. Michael Osterholm, Regents Professor McKnight, Presidential Endowed Chair in Public Health and Director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy here at the University of Minnesota. He's a member of the National Academy of Medicine and the Council on Foreign Relations. From uh, 2018 to 19, he served as science envoy for health security.
for the U.S. Department of State. And in November 2020, he was appointed by then President-elect Joe Biden to a 13-member transition COVID-19 advisory board. Mike is a frequent consultant to the WHO, NIH, FDA, Department of Defense, and the CDC. Uh, Mike? Well, first of all, thank you very much, Susan. It's good to be with all of you here. And I have one disclosure to make that uh, Larry and Dr. T are among my most dearest, respected, and appreciated colleagues. So uh, we are all in, in, in a common bond in that regard today. Also, I think that as much as it's been put together here as the uh, sense that it's a pro and con, I'm all about nuancing today. That's what I think uh, is really the critical issue to have when we talk about mandates and how to get people vaccinated. I have one simple goal is vaccinate as many possible people as we can, as quickly as we can against this virus. It is even more urgent today in this country with regard to what's happening with respect to the uh, variants as we see them. We know today that uh, uh, the Delta variant is wrecking havoc in many communities in this country, and that's only going to continue. So first and foremost, make it very clear, I am extremely pro-vaccine and have been throughout my entire career. Uh, my work on the transition advisory board uh, with the Biden administration was all about maximizing the availability of vaccines. And so from that perspective, you're going to find, I think, a common voice in all three of us today. Where I do have a question is one about nuancing. And when I say nuancing, what I think has happened today is a lot of people misunderstand what a mandate can and can't do. And first of all, let me make it very clear. Mandates are completely tied to the location and the jurisdiction upon which you reside. Some states have very different uh, laws regarding how mandates might be implemented or mandated, how institutions may be able to put them in place. In some cases, it's a situation of you are a public or a private institution because there the ability to do uh, the kind of, of mandate work that we're talking about here may vary just from a legal standpoint. Um, you know, I, as a matter of just for background and fact, uh, 135A.14 is a law that was passed in 1989 called the Statement of Immunization. It was the first law that we really had on the books in Minnesota to in fact mandate routine childhood immunizations for children uh, in our schools and then subsequently, more importantly, in our institutions of higher learning. And uh, I was one of the four people that worked very hard as state epidemiologists to get that through the Minnesota legislature. So I have every interest and every previous experience of trying to promote vaccinations. But within that law, it lays out exactly the point that I want to raise here today that may not be relevant for every location, but it is relevant for a number of them. Within that law, we have, for example, in Minnesota, exemptions from immunization. Now, COVID-19 has not been included yet in this law, so I want to be clear about this. This is the theoretical basis. But those exemptions from immunization include medical, include natural disease or immunity, meaning you've already had it and you can prove that you had it and you have protection, or consciously held beliefs, where they're under religious beliefs or frankly, for any matter you want, you can defer this vaccine if you so choose. So in a sense, I think most people would say, well, is that really a mandate? If in fact, all I have to do is sign a piece of paper and actually have a notary public say, I don't want the vaccine and I'm out. Well, let's draw this together as to who is it today we're trying to address. There are really three different uh, or, uh, buckets of potential vaccinees. One are what I call the vaccine affirmative. They couldn't wait to get the vaccine. They'd drive 150 miles to find a vaccine clinic in the earliest days. Those individuals, we already have them vaccinated. Thank you. The middle group I call the vaccine hesitant. These are people who have many concerns about the safety, the effectiveness, what this vaccine will do. And in a sense, they're working through their willingness to take the vaccine. I'll talk, comment more on that in a moment. And then finally, there's the vaccine hostile. These are individuals, as we've seen this disease so divide our country, often along political lines, are under no conditions willing to take this vaccine. Well, I will just say that in all of my 46 years in public health, 
having promoted childhood immunization in every way possible, please do not compare this situation to childhood immunizations. It is not. It is very, very different in terms of what are the factors against getting vaccinated and how the various uh, vaccine hostile community will promote that. And the fact that because of the vaccine's newness, because of these questions, there are truly legitimate issues that have been raised that we must address. My concern has been at the University of Minnesota and a number of institutions like it, if we have these exemptions, I can promise you right now, having interviewed students, faculty and staff, if they have concerns and they're said today, you have to get the vaccine or sign your statement of exemption, they will sign the statement of exemption, which from a standpoint of a public health approach, how do we get those people back? How do we actually bring the vaccine hesitant back in? Remember the vaccine, the vaccine hostile are there. We're not going to change that. If you do a mandate in our state, they will sign. And what I've never seen before is the organized activity around the country. There's at least two different groups of individuals, student groups in particular, who are now willing to go to every university and college institution of higher learning in this country and actually when notarized statements are needed before a person can exempt themselves out, they're willing to actually set up booths and student unions and so forth to actually assist students in not getting vaccinated. As we've already heard with the litigation in Indiana, I'm sure it's not the first, it won't be the last. And one of the challenges we have when you have a charged environment of where you have litigation going on, the challenge is, will people then actually listen to the messages that we in public health are trying to deliver. We at Minnesota have had a major outreach effort trying to get people vaccinated by education. And we're gonna hear from Dr. T more about what that kind of education can accomplish and why that's important. So let me just say that I very much support mandates and I have supported them for all my career. But this is one time where I think nuancing at this point where there are so many questions yet about the vaccine for those institutions that offer these exemptions as part of the mandate, please know that you won't guarantee that your college, your university, your institution of higher learning is fully vaccinated. I've had a number of professors who have said to me, you know, I don't agree with you. I want a classroom that's vaccinated. I want a classroom that I can feel safe in. And my response back is, under this mandate in Minnesota, you wouldn't have that. If there's exemptions, then in fact, you won't know who's vaccinated and who's not. And that information can't be shared with you. And it's just the reality of you can't guarantee that that's going to be the case. Now, let me just say that when you look at the issues today, the challenges are real. The Kaiser Family Foundation have done an, an excellent job of polling Americans to try to understand where they're at with vaccines. And their most recent data, they've actually documented that more than half of the public believe or are unsure about some of the common COVID-19 vaccine myths. We still have a big job to do to educate people. How many of those people will just automatically agree to be vaccinated when exemptions are available? I don't know. And I can't answer that and only time will tell. But I can tell you that we have evidence that if you keep working with these populations, you can make a difference. You can bring them to be vaccinated as opposed to forcing them into an exemption status. When we look at the issues around the questions that have been raised, right now we see the black and Hispanic adults are much more likely than white adults to express concerns about access to the vaccine and what the vaccine means to them. Is this at a time when we want to selectively shut out the BIPOC community, the communities of color in general, in terms of being part of an educational process and moving them there? In addition, when we look at should colleges, universities, and even K through 12 actually in, uh, enact mandates? Well, it is true that in fact, 58% of American adults do believe that universities and colleges should have a mandate, 58%. But when you look at uh, those individuals who are parents, and particularly parents with children under the age of 18, only 37% support a mandate. Again, we're a very divided country. And at what point do we just say, division's gonna be there, we're not gonna change anybody else's mind, you're either on or you're off, and you get to decide. I think that's a huge challenge. Let me just conclude by saying, 
Over the next few weeks, you're going to hear more and more data about breakthrough cases. You're going to hear more data about reduced vaccine effectiveness, particularly with the Delta variant, all going to confuse the public at a time when, for many of us, we're now saying, make a choice. You're going to get vaccinated. You got to buy the mandate you do. Or if you don't want to get vaccinated, this is the exemption clause, and you can use that. For institutions that don't have an exemption clause, which I don't believe there are many, uh, or in fact, you have the ability through your private sector status, whatever, to enlist an absolute mandate, then, you know, that's it. That's gold. But please understand that this is not about right or wrong. This is not about you want to or you don't want to be vaccinated. We want to get as many people vaccinated as possible. The question is, how do we get there? And unfortunately, far too often in COVID, we've had too many debates about yes or no. And we've not been able to take the time to ask ourselves, how is going to be the route that will get us to the very best of all answers? I just leave you with the fact that I think there are many that think that uh, college mandates are a commonly held approach right now among American colleges and universities. I agree with Larry. I think it's possible that when, in fact, the vaccines finally are fully licensed, that will surely change the uh, decision of some institutions. But right now, only 13% of U.S. colleges and universities have noted a mandate for the school opening in just a month away. So this is far from being the most common approach. And interestingly enough, because I have been somewhat outspoken on this, I've heard from college and university leaders around the country. Number one, I'm struck by the fact that I've heard from some of the leaders who have said that they're going to do a mandate and then they come back and say, now what have we decided to do? How are we going to do that? I've also heard from a number of institutions, leaders who have said, we have the very same concern. We think that between now and sometime this fall into winter, we can get more people vaccinated by having major, concerted, comprehensive outreach to those vaccine hesitant. We won't get the vaccine hostile in. They're done. But we can get the vaccine hesitant. Now, that's a choice I think for now I'd like to exercise. If it's wrong and we're not seeing that that happen, then I think we can go back to the drawing table and say, okay, let's look at the next option. But for now, I hope that we have the wisdom to actually take a step back and say, how do we get the most number of people vaccinated in this country as quickly as possible? And I'm not sure that an all-inclusive absolute mandate is going to be the way to accomplish that. So thank you, and I really look forward to the discussion with my very distinguished and dear colleagues. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mike. And the statute in Minnesota that Mike made reference to is actually, the link is posted on the website for this webinar if you want to take a look. I'm thrilled to introduce our third speaker, Dr. Stephen Thomas, Professor of Health Policy and Management at the University of Maryland. Dr. Thomas is Director of the Maryland Center for Health Equity and Principal Investigator with Dr. Sandra Quinn for the NIH NIMHD Center of Excellence in Race, Ethnicity, and Health Disparities Research. He is one of our nation's leading scholars in the effort to eliminate racial and ethnic health disparities. He's received numerous awards over the years, and his work has been recognized as one of the scholarly contributions leading to the 1997 presidential apology to survivors of the syphilis study done at Tuskegee. His current research focuses on the translation of evidence-based science on chronic disease into community-based interventions designed to eliminate disparities in health and healthcare, including in the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Thomas? Thank you very much, Professor Wolf. That's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, just do a thumbs up if you can hear me okay. Very good. Um, well, you know, uh, coming behind uh, uh, Dr. Gostin and, uh, and Osterholm is a, a big lift. But you know what? In many ways, they set the table for me. Um, context matters. And so when you say mandate, um, what is the mental map that comes to one's mind? In some places, it might be, 
hey, you remember those mandates for school busing to achieve desegregation? You remember all the fights that came after that? Um, so in some communities, the word mandate is the beginning of the conversation stopper. So how do we get past that? Even when Larry uh, Gostin described the legal framework, he used something that we all learn in public health, that we have police powers. I'm just telling you, when I go into the black community and talk about mandates in the context of police powers, their mental maps are completely different than what ours might be here in public health. It's a conversation stopper. When I talked uh, in the community, you see my barber poles behind me because I'm working in barbershops and beauty salons to address issues around health disparities. And I talked to them about herd immunity. You know what they said to me? This is back in February during Black History Month. Dr. Thomas, well, they call me Dr. T. That's where the nickname came from. We're not cows. We're not horses. I said, no, no, no. Herd immunity means I tried to explain it to them. And their response back to me was, well, that sounds like community immunity. And that's the term that we've been using ever since. Community immunity, contextualizing, reframing, and educating. If you look at the newspaper stories, the legacy of the Tuskegee syphilis study comes up time and time again as a reason for, for why African Americans are hesitant to participate in getting the vaccine. And yet, the real contextual story of Tuskegee is that from 1932 to 1972, those men were denied treatment. The entire apparatus of our public health infrastructure was mobilized to keep these men from getting treatment. That was a different kind of mandate. So the lesson today is to ensure that every effort is made to ensure that African Americans and other underrepresented minority groups actually get easy access to the vaccine and that we address their concerns through persuasion. And that's where I believe that we can make a difference in rebuilding trust. We are, are, are in a, the foundation of trust of our profession is under attack. And I don't think anyone have imagined that we would have elected officials and an entire TV broadcast network involved in the spread of the misinformation. That's new. So when we see public health professionals, be it the health director in Tennessee or others around the country who have left their jobs, lost their jobs, here's what I didn't see. I didn't see public health rallying behind those folks to get their jobs back. So we feel very vulnerable in this moment that we're in. And so I would feel a lot better if we talked, if mandates were talked about in the same breath as a comprehensive effort to educate the community and to address their questions and to actually build trust. I feel even a lot better if we could mandate some acts of kindness. How about that? Because we're going into a moment right now where it's going to be more us and them uh, that the unvaccinated are perceived as keeping the country from moving forward. And the extent to which those racial and ethnic minority populations are among those unvaccinated, it's once again stigmatizing the very communities suffering the most from this um, pandemic. And so the work that we've been doing over the past several uh, uh, couple of months is called Shots at the Shop. And it's an initiative that's been embraced by the White House to literally bring vaccine clinics in the barbershops and beauty salons. Uh, and, I, and I would like to take your audience into one of those shops so they can see what that persuasion looks like. So I have somebody there behind the scenes. Let me have him run that videotape. I want you to meet Katrina Randolph at Trey Shades. Videotape, my friend. Welcome to Shots at the Shop. And today we're at Katrina's Trey Shades Hair Studio in Capitol Heights, Maryland, which has been amazing. My favorite part is um, saving lives, seeing people get vaccinated because a lot of people are hesitant to get vaccinated. So if I can advocate and encourage them, I'm excited to do so. A lot of people just don't trust the system. 
so we have to take the time to answer their questions. And what better place to do that than in a place they already trust? They can dispel some myths and um, misinformation that's out there. And then they can refer them to others with you know, more specific questions. I've honestly seen about 25 to 30 of my clients go from, no, I'm not getting that vaccine, to so sure, sure, I'll get vaccinated or show up at your clinic on Monday. I got my vaccination. Well, I was comfortable with coming here. I actually feel comfortable here than I would at a normal clinic. I like it because this is, I know this place is not like a strange, it's not strange or anything. You truly are barbers and stylists, a trusted voice in the community. And we want to tap into your expertise and be a good community partner. It's just for us to be knowledgeable in these health disparities so that we can have conversations behind our chair because I believe that we're more than just a hairstylist. We're touching people just like doctors and nurses do. Any barbershop that wants to hold a vaccine clinic in their place of business will find you a clinical partner. So we can bring in all the clinical expertise. I say just do it. Just work on saving lives. Keep um, advocating for the community, bringing more people in. And I do believe that having a vaccine clinic at a salon is, is well worth it. It worked here at Trey Shades, and it could work in your barbershop or beauty salon as well. Yes, sir, you're fully vaccinated. It was a great day. I think we need more Katrinas. And that relationship that you saw there is being replicated around the country. And guess what? It's part of the infrastructure we didn't have in place. It's filling the broken parts of our system. And to me, right now, we should redouble our efforts to build out that. We need allies like Katrina and the other barbers and stylists to help us on the front lines and to amplify the positive message of why we need to be vaccinated to save lives. And so um, I believe that the nuance, and I'm eager for the conversation that comes next, we talk about university faculty, staff, and students. I'm thinking about those blue collar workers, Mike. Uh, Larry, I'm thinking about those landscapers that keep your campus so beautiful, okay? Uh, those are the workers that I'm concerned and wanna make sure their voices are heard and that their issues are addressed. In many ways, this is our opportunity to rebuild trust with communities that have been historically left out of our healthcare system and suffer from the very conditions that we know how to cure. And uh, I'm, I, I think that uh, um, it is definitely appropriate for, for us to have this conversation and recognize that what we do and how we uh, resolve this has implications for the broader community uh, that live in the shadow of our institutions. And with that, I'll turn back the floor to you, uh, Professor Wolf, and look forward to the conversation. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much, Dr. T. Uh, we're now gonna go to the panel. So if we could bring up all the speakers, uh, we've got a lot of great questions already, but I wanna remind you that if you have a question or comment, all you need to do is email it to consortm at umn.edu. So keep it coming. So um, let me kick it off here. Uh, Mike, you talked about the exemptions. When you look at the Indiana University case, where we just got the court decision, as Larry mentioned, on Monday, um, the court describes that mandate as really a choice uh, so that people who exercise their right to a medical or religious exemption um, instead uh, had to undergo uh, periodic testing and they were obliged to mask. So um, let's talk about that choice. Um, how do you how do you view that? Well, I think obviously the issue is whatever we can do to bring people towards the vaccine. Uh, if in fact uh, those additional uh, you might say disincentives to not be vaccinated, 
then I think they're, they're appropriate. How much reduction occurs with regards to those two efforts and, for example, testing how often and so forth, you know, what is the actual efficacy of face cloth covering wearing, say, versus an N95, I think are all still issues to be decided. But, you know, I'm, I am for whatever will get people vaccinated the most number. And to me, uh, you know, I'm more than willing to be uh, convinced that, in fact, in a sense, going over or around the people's indecision will mean more people get vaccinated than I think at a time like this with such a, a, a very significant public health threat, then let's go for it. But I think right now, and I think that Dr. T really shared a sense of what I'm hearing from many of the affected communities that are not getting vaccinated, it's not that they won't, it's just that they're not there yet and we need to get them there. And if we make them make a snap decision now, we will seal in a decision that will be much harder to return, to reverse. And so that is where I'm, I'm at and I will go with whatever it gets most people vaccinated. So Larry, how do you react to that idea that if we really make people make a snap decision now, we're gonna lock them in to a no? It could be true. We don't know. I mean, the, the truth is, is that, you know, we don't have enough evidence to be able to say it. I mean, what we want to do is to try to vaccinate as many people. Well, basically, I, I what I've told Georgetown University is two things. Um, the first is, is that we want to ensure a safe and secure community that is safe and secure and that people feel safe and secure in. Um, most likely the best way of doing that is to have a fully vaccinated community. The, you know, we've tried non-therapeutic interventions before with masking and distancing. And frankly, there was a, uh, we didn't do well with it. Um, Georgetown did fairly well, but there were a lot of universities that had major outbreaks, particularly in the Midwest. I'm not sure about the University of Minnesota. Um, so I don't have any confidence that if we just mask and distance, we can do this. So we want to get as many people vaccinated. No, so say if somebody says, I won't vaccinate. Okay, um, I won't, I mean, I'm not going to hold you down and inject you. Um, but you're going, but but it's not going to be an easy choice for you. You're going to be, have to get tested, you know, once or twice a week. Most of us really don't want to do that, and you're going to have to mask when everyone else is not masking. Most people won't, don't want to do that, and so I don't want to make. I want to get. I want to have a system where vaccination is the default or easiest choice. I have no desire. You know to you know to compel people and to force them into doing something they do, but they do have to take the consequences um, to make sure that everybody's safe, and that's our tradition, as you know, Susan. Um, that you know we 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 can act as a, as a as a society to ensure the public's health and safety. And what Dr. T said, I just want to jump in. I know I'm, I know I'm going on, but then I'll be quiet, um, was really important to me um, because I've always said right from the start that I don't think that I'll, uh, most of the philosophical arguments against vaccination, I don't buy. I don't buy the bodily integrity, freedom, me, you know, my <laughs> rights stuff, but I do buy the equity argument. Uh, I think, you know, equity has to be front and center. And that's the one that troubles me the most. Can I just add a piece here? Because I think, and I really appreciate how Larry has framed this. I think it is very, very helpful. But let me just add a, a nuance again. I keep coming back to that word. I was contacted by several of the institutions that have decided to do mandates. And they've done exactly as Indiana is trying to lay out, where if you don't get vaccinated, you then have to wear a mask and get tested. Well, the testing they can actually enforce in the sense that you can electronically know, but the masking they couldn't, and they had no idea how they're going to enforce that. They said, are we going to get a masking police that goes around? Because remember, you can't disclose to faculty, students, etc., who's been vaccinated or not as part of their health record. 
And so the question was, how will anyone know if you're masked, if in fact you haven't been vaccinated? And I think that's one of the challenges we have is in our effort to do good, and we want to do good. The question is, how are you going to do that? What's going to be the mechanism that will actually make people get masked? And I haven't yet to see an, an institution that has actually successfully come up with an answer for that. You know, what John, I, go ahead. I was just wondering, what's wrong with us? What's wrong with us? We're the country that created the internet. We came up with these vaccines in what can only be described as a miracle time, miracle time. And we can't get this into the arms of our people. OK, so what is wrong that we would have elected officials pushing in just the opposite direction? As we're talking right now, those public health police powers you talked about, Larry, that has given us the authority to do mandates. They're trying to undermine that legislation as we're talking right now. The implications here are beyond just COVID. If they unravel the foundation of the public health infrastructure, the police powers that allow us to protect ourselves, it has implications beyond COVID. So that's my concern. And, and so are we really ready to fight? If the house is on fire, you don't whisper, get to the nearest expert exit. You yell it. My sense is that we're, 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 we play so nice and we're up against forces that are not playing nice. And I just don't know if we're ready for it. Therefore, let's change the field of play. Let's change the conversation. And for me, that is building these bridges to communities that have been left out, that are suffering from the health disparities. In that little clip, you saw a president of a hospital the president of the hospital saying, we are here to reestablish our trusted relationship with this community. We should be doing that around the country so that the um, outreach that's occurring now in the name of COVID doesn't just disappear when the surge threat is gone because these health disparities are not going anywhere. And last but not least, for a lot of people in my community, they're not afraid of death per se. Just go to any black funeral. It's talking about the people on the other side. I'll see you later. Like, you know, that's not fear, but they don't want to suffer. And we're not showing anyone what COVID does. When those cameras come into the hospital, they stop right there at that ICU door and we see the health workers that we lift up and praise, but we're not hearing from the actual people and seeing their suffering. I think we have to do that. And last but not least, I've seen commercials every single night at the national news advertising prescription drugs, Larry, prescription drugs direct to consumer marketing. And the photos and the images and the music is just so inviting. I told my wife, I wanna take Fosamax. She said, no, that's for women in osteoporosis. I said, look how much fun they're having. And then they describe <laughs> It could cause blindness, deafness. They go through a whole list. If any of those things were associated with COVID, nobody, vaccines, nobody would. And those are approved drugs. So here's what I would say to you. Where are these companies that we paid billions of dollars to in advance? Where's the direct-to-consumer marketing on their part? They know how to do it. Why haven't we seen J&J &J rehabilitate its vaccine on TV commercials? I haven't seen it. Why haven't we seen any of these pharmaceutical companies on the television using their power of persuasion to do the marketing to help overcome vaccine hesitancy? Why have they not done that? We have paid them in advance. So we, we, we have to uh, stand on the common good. We have to bring that back into our conversation. And these companies have a responsibility in that regard. They have solutions they're sitting on at a time when the house is on fire. So Dr. T, let me ask you to use your powers of persuasion uh, on a question we have from a student. Let me, I wanna get some of the real voices in here from our big audience watching. So this student writes, I'm a part of the age group 18 to 29 years old. And I am not at high risk of dying from COVID. I'm shortening the question. Uh, 
the student writes, this disease isn't much more deadly in my age group than the flu. If I don't get the vaccine, the worst thing that can happen to me would be I get COVID-19, but I don't care if I get the disease. Me not getting the disease won't do I mean, uh, people harm. I mean, getting the disease won't do other people harm. If they are worried about getting the disease, then they should get the vaccine. They should mask. They should take precautions. That's the way to protect them. Leave me alone. What do you say to that student? Well, you know, I would say, you know, it's not about me. It's about we. And do you have anybody in your family that you love? Do you have anyone you care about? Well, let me introduce you to a young woman who got COVID and gave it to her grandmother. Her grandmother never came home from the hospital. Okay. She is racked with guilt. I killed my grandmother. We're not hearing those stories because they're ashamed. If we could hear more of those stories, because trust me, some of those 600,000 people were infected by someone they loved. Maybe this young man would recognize it's more we than me. Larry, you said earlier that Stephen's arguments about equity really packed a punch. So given the arguments he made, do you think, that, does that give you pause about recommending that universities and colleges embrace mandates? Well, um, I do think Stephen is right about equity. Um, I think he's just as right about the common good, frankly, though. And, and to me, the equity question loomed largest when there was inequitable access to the vaccine. There still is, um, but not on the supply side. Um, and so I worried that we would visit um, burdens on people who literally couldn't get access to the vaccine. Um, that's much rarer now. Um, and it would be even still more rare if, if we had Stephen's kind of barbershop diplomacy, which I love. <laughs> um, uh, so my bigger concern about equity now, frankly, is internationally and global. As you know, I do a lot of global health work with international vaccine passports and things like that, um, which have been, you know, the European Union has just roll, rolled it out. And, um, WHO is, is against these, these um, uh, passports because of the equity problem. And I, I agree with them on that. But I think in the United States, um, as long as we keep equity front and center, make sure that everyone who wants a vaccine can get a vaccine, um, I know at Georgetown, anyone who, who doesn't have one in our community, staff, faculty, or student, will will bring the vaccine to them. You know, they can get it right in their right at the university. Um, so I um, I'm less concerned about that, and I think uh, I, the, the the safety and security that everyone gains. One thing I want to mention, you know, we we spend a lot of time talking about how, you know, you know we, um, we wring our hands and worry, oh, well, what about, we don't really want to force anybody to do what they're not comfortable with. We don't want to ask anybody to visit any consequence if they don't get a vaccine. But remember, there are most of us in the university campuses, the vast majority, we, we feel that we want, we, people should concentrate on us, on the common good, on the community. And that if we have a large number of unvaccinated people among us, it places us all at risk. And it also places our, our fellow students or, or, or faculty or staff at risk who, who, who can't get a vaccine because they're immunocompromised. Um, or if they're going home to children who can't be vaccinated. And so I think we also have to think about not the me, 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 but the we, we, we. What we can, we have to stop in America 
all of our obsession with what are my rights. My rights are important. I, I was the head of the British Civil Liberties Union and the board of directors of the ACLU. They are important. But also important is, you know, the common good and the common welfare. Uh -huh. um, what, what, what duties we owe our neighbors and our community members. That's very important to me. I think we have to recenter ourselves in the United States toward a more social way of thinking. Um, let me pick up on that, Mike, and turn to you uh, by bringing in a question from an employee at a university. And this person says that they were told by their doctor that they are at heightened risk of bad outcome from COVID. Uh, now we're talking about coming back to work at the university where we have no idea who has been vaccinated. Um, if everyone on campus were told to get vaccinated, barring medical reasons or conscientious objection, I and others like me would have more protection, not perfect, but more. Um, this person says um, we require other vaccines in that statute. So why not this one? Well, first of all, I think the, the person asking the question is surely in a difficult position. I understand that. We have 12 million Americans in this country who are immune compromised or immune deficient in some way. And that is something we are obviously very concerned about. So let me just offer my uh, support in saying you have every reason to be concerned. But let's not confuse what we want with what we can do. And I think that's been the problem. You can't know how many professors I've had or staff and some, some students at the University of Minnesota sent me emails and say, this Delta is really bad. Now we have to mandate as if somehow the situation by making it worse meant that there was more reason to mandate the vaccine. What they failed to realize is that a mandate doesn't change any of the issue around exemptions if in fact anyone can exempt themselves. And so again, the vaccine hostile, I think we have to just understand that unlike any childhood immunization we've ever had, this is a very, very different group. I've spent the last 46 years of my life dealing with those vaccine preventable diseases, everything I possibly can to stop them. There is no comparable situation between any other vaccine, including things like even the issue with HPV vaccine, nothing like this. So the fact of the matter is, is that mandating, it doesn't make that person any safer. It gives them a false sense of security. The same people who weren't going to get vaccinated before won't get vaccinated now with the mandate if they're in the hostile group. The group that we can change are, in fact, the vaccine hesitant. Now, a very good question was raised, though, because we do have an obligation to those individuals who have a greater likelihood of severe disease to accommodate them. Uh, I can tell you at the University of Minnesota, starting the end of July, uh, N95 respirators are going to be made available to all faculty, staff, and students, and they'll be face fitted. And that, in fact, adding that kind of protection is what is at this point in the world of not knowing who is vaccinated because you can't legally know that um, is, in fact, going to be, I think, the next best step. So I just want to come back to no matter how emotional, in a sense, the issue gets, because it's painful to think I might be at risk. It doesn't help it by just saying, let's mandate it. If the mandate had no exceptions, you either mandate it, you got it, you had proof of it, or you're not on campus, that'd be a different situation. But for many institutions around the country, that doesn't exist. And so if it doesn't exist, we are fooling ourselves into a false sense of security. And so it's just like the issue today in a sense of going into a store somewhere that says, if you're unvaccinated, mask. If you're vaccinated, you don't have to. Do we have any assurances at all that people are really adhering to that? Do I want to take responsibility for myself and say, you know what? Oh, look at everybody in here is masked who's, who's not vaccinated. I'd be naive to think that were the case. And so part of the challenge we have today is we don't have an easy answer. I think Larry and, and Dr. T and I would celebrate beyond anything we could imagine if tonight we knew that we could get 100% of the people vaccinated in the next six weeks. It would be remarkable. But we also have to say when we can't do that, 
what can we do to get the most number of vaccinated and to give people a reasonable expectation of what their risk is. So please don't think that a mandate with ex exemptions is going to get you anywhere close to a fully vaccinated campus. It is simply not going to happen. That's why I said what's wrong with us, because in Europe, they have a way. Lester Holt described his trip to Japan and all the steps along the way where he was tested. He had the app on his phone. We have none of that by choice. That's what I don't get. So there's no way to, to can't trust and verify. So that's my concern and why we need to keep the persuasion up because the backlash is an erosion continued erosion of trust we're giving million dollar lotteries to people okay well what happens when the next one comes two million dollar lotteries we're not using the moment to change behavior to reshape social norms and i don't think anyone anticipated that there would be both elected officials and a huge broadcast network pushing in just the opposite direction that we're pushing. That's a game changer. And there are few among us willing to do what Dr. Fauci had to do at that hearing and call a sitting senator a liar. That's what we've gotten to. That's where we are. I have elected officials that tell me, you public health people are too nice. <laughs> Whatever decision I make, he says, I'm going to get yelled at by somebody. So if, 90, if we can get 90% there, with a mandate, fine, let the others uh, yell at us. He's an elected official, he's in a different role than we are. But he does have a point. We don't fight that way. And we're unprepared for the opposition that's out there. So Larry, there is also an equity issue when it comes to information sources. Why is the story that I'm trying to tell about the conversion of the hesitant to being vaccinated the outreach in the barbershops and beauty salons. You know what, uh, Professor Wolf, a lot of those stories live behind the paywall of these newspapers. They say they're making COVID stories of, in front of the paywall. But Larry, those are the CDC surveillance, the FDA guidelines and regulations. But these human stories, they're behind a paywall. So our communities are still marinating in misinformation. That's an equity issue as well. Listen, it's just been six months that we got a new administration. We've had four years of the creation of the challenge that we're trying to overcome. I know we're impatient, but we really have just scratched the surface of what's in front of us. And we should not abandon our effort to persuade, to build trust, and let the natural process, when it becomes a licensed uh, pharmaceutical, uh, yeah, we're going to see mandates at hospital workers, et cetera, just like they're mandated for flu shots now. But I don't want these companies off the hook to use their marketing power, their commercial ability to get us to take. Uh, why, why, why are they marketing prescription drugs to me? I can't write a prescription. They know what they're doing. I've seen none of their power being used to actually overcome the issues that we're talking about here. Why? We have paid them in advance. Larry, did you want to respond? Well, I didn't take it as 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 as, as a, something that was directly to, directed to me. I agree with all of that. I do think you know. I think our I, I think our health outreach has been pathetic. And, you know, and I know that uh, the Biden administration has said a lot of the right things about it. Um, but I do think that. Um, the kind of outreach that uh, Dr. T is talking about is exactly what we should be doing. Okay, uh, I wanna get to more of our questions for our audience. And so here, this is directed both to Dr. T and to Mike. A lot of our universities include academic health centers and medical facilities. Uh, do you object to vaccine mandates in those healthcare settings? Well, I've been on record for some time. I absolutely do not object if they can be done. The challenge even there in healthcare is when there's an exemption, what does that mean? How do you reach out to those people with exemptions? I think there's a unique burden 
that we all uh, have in the healthcare setting if you're going to provide patient care and the potential risk of transmitting to someone in the healthcare setting that clearly puts you in a very unique category of why you should be vaccinated. So again, I think the, the confusion is it appears that you're either for mandates or you're not. That is the false dichotomy. It's all about what are we going to do to get the most number of people vaccinated as quickly as possible? It's the old idea of, you know, the honey versus the vinegar. You know, what is it that draws people to that point? And that's where I come from. To me, it's a very simple bottom line. What's it going to do take to get the most number of people vaccinated? So I took a look at one of these lists of, of vaccine uh, um, uh, exemptions from an academic uh, health science university, Professor Wolf. And you know what I saw in there that surprised me? It said that you could be exempt if you were pregnant or wanting to become pregnant. Now, I mentioned that because I've been communicating in the barbershops and salons and everywhere else that pregnancy is not a counterindication. And even if you're seeking to become pregnant, you can actually protect your unborn child in advance. So why would a major university have that as an exemption? My point to you is that this was shared with me by a physician when the patient said, this is why I'm not getting vaccinated. And the physician had no idea that the institution had that as a uh, exemption. It adds confusion because she has been telling this person it's okay to be vaccinated. And here it is on the list as an exemption. Why? It's not part of a CDC guideline. So here's the nuances and how people are interpreting and, and doing things that actually, again, counterindicated in the sense of undermining the trust in the science that we've been communicating. Should we start writing letters to the editor of, uh, or, or, or write directly to that president of that institution? These things are happening. And I'm only saying this to say the burden cannot all be placed on the individual as well. What's wrong with you that you're not getting vaccinated? Because they're getting information that is conflicting and confusing to them. And some of that is coming from us. We've got to get our act together. So let's get to that information because we have a number of questions um, that say, okay, if a university is not going to mandate a COVID vaccine, what then? What can and should students, faculty, there's even a question about a parent, do in order to protect themselves and protect their families. For example, one person says, if a university is not going to mandate the vaccine, should they mandate mask usage? We're seeing that in Los Angeles County now. Um, Larry, do you want to kick off with that? Um, about mask mandates? Mask mandates. You know, if, you, if there's not going to be a vaccine mandate, what can and should the people in these university well, communities do well you know we've been through this for a year we, we we and cdc has guidance on it um we we know we what we what we did at georgetown and what most universities did was to have a you know rigorous regime of uh, of testing um, of self-attestation, you know, an app where you have to say if you've got illness. Um, we distanced, um, we required universal masking um, anywhere on campus. Um, we were some successful to, to, to a large degree, but we did have outbreaks in some of our student dorms and things like that. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of other places weren't successful. There's one thing that really um, strikes me about the COVID pandemic, just generally speaking, is, is that no matter how hard we try, um, it's been really, really hard to stop this wily virus um, uh, by masking and distancing. Even the countries that have done extraordinarily well, like Australia or um, Vietnam, uh, or, or, or Japan, as we see now, or South Korea, 
it keeps roaring back. So I do not have high confidence that if we have crowded universities uh, this fall, um, where, where a significant number of people are unvaccinated in the community, I don't have confidence we can control it. That's why I think what you're hearing from all three of the panelists is that we really need to use all of our tools to get people vaccinated. And I want to talk a little bit about exemptions. Um, you know, because uh, universities probably have to give an exemption under uh, EEOC rules um, for medical or religious. Medical has to be genuinely medical and it's very rare, if at all, that somebody literally can't get a vaccine because of a medical reason. They may not be able to mount a robust immune response, but it's not going to harm them and certainly not for pregnant women, as Dr. T said, um, but also religious exemptions. A religious exemption should be moral, not philosophical. There are no philosophical exemptions. Religious, they have to be very, very narrow. And we've seen uh, from state mandate levels that if you eliminate uh, exemptions, which California and New York and others have done, which you can't do, I, universities can't do that under the law. But if you make them narrow, I think you um, do a better job in getting vaccination um, high coverage. Um, in fact, just to put a point on that, we have a question. Uh, I am the parent of a fully vaccinated son who will be a freshman in college this fall and his school is mandating the COVID vaccine, but I worry that the exemptions will swallow the rule. Um, so in addition to asking, what do you all think constitutes a valid exemption? This questioner, this parent asks whether on a campus requiring vaccination, a student should be able to request a roommate who is also vaccinated. I have college age kids myself. I've seen how small those rooms are. Mike, what do you think? Uh, sure, if you can accommodate that, and I don't understand obviously the legal implications of what information can and can't be shared uh, about one's health status, but I would very much support any kind of issues like that. So you think that the student should be able to say, I am vaccinated and I request a roommate willing to disclose their vaccine status and who is fully vaccinated. I would support that. I can find no harm in that whatsoever. So you see what's coming? You see what's coming? Let's extend that now to the hospital. I can't have a private room. Well, I wanna make sure that whoever's in my room is vaccinated. I mean, we got we got a mess of, on our hands coming of us, them, again. How do we avoid that? That's what I'm trying to because when it when it gets uh, calcified, when it gets locked in, I'm afraid it's going to also get locked in in ways that racial and ethnic minority communities will be seen as the um, recalcitrants, and therefore you just see me walking down the street, you're going to make an assumption. Oh, he's unvaccinated. He's a risk person. We're getting there. And you have states. Why would a state pass a law, Larry? Why would a state pass a law that you can't ask? Why would you do that? Once you make it a law, then it has to be a law to undo it. That's what is throwing me off. Laws being passed that will hurt us down the road beyond COVID. Yeah. You're absolutely right. I mean, I, I wrote a, um, uh, an op-ed for STAT yesterday, and today I had one for McCormish.com on CNN saying pretty much exactly that. Um, you know, it, it seems to me that you know, the only way you can make sense of CDC and our public health guidance um, that, that differentiate between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated and, and masking and distancing is to know who is vaccinated or not vaccinated. Um, you should be able to ask. 
and the federal government should support those kinds of systems. Uh, it, you know, I, I get why uh, the Biden administration is not supporting it because, it, but it's only political. There's no other reason. Um, and we're diverting from all of our allies and peers. So I do agree with you. And I think your point, Dr. T, about the wider implications of the legal environment beyond COVID are extraordinarily important. I hope people will hear what you're saying. We have another set of questions that are focusing on adverse events. This questioner says, data show there have been serious adverse events uh, shortly after vaccination, including myocarditis, Guillain-Barre, blood clots, and death, including in younger individuals at very low risk from serious COVID outcomes. Um, how can universities and colleges defend mandates under in the face of those risks? Larry, do you wanna take that first? Yeah, that's an easy one. <laughs> that's a softball question if I've ever, if I've ever seen one. Um, you, know, you know, some of the risks that were talked about have been associated with some of the vaccines um, other of those risks have not been really uh, anywhere near causally related to the vaccines. But nonetheless, whether the, whether the adverse effect is real or it's not real, um, it pales in comparison to the risk of COVID. Um, these are extraordinarily rare risks. And, you know, in the United States, you know, if you, you know, if you, I don't, well, not in the United States, in all of medicine, I don't think you get a safer, more effective medical intervention, a drug, a medical device or anything than a, than a COVID-19 vaccine. Um, we can't assure 100% that nothing, that there'll never be an adverse event. event. It's just, that's just not the world we live in. We can't assure for 100% that there'll never be a breakthrough infection. Nothing is perfect. But these COVID vaccines are as close to pure heaven um, that any of us have seen. So, so Mike, Mike, just before you comment on that, let me just say this. I'm, I'm back to the approved drugs I get marketed every night on TV. And the side effects are like horrendous, horrendous. <laughs> They're legal. So, so why is it that this looms so large? It keeps coming up even in our work about the side effects of the vaccine. We've got to talk about long haulers. We've got to say this is not the flu. The flu does not lead to you getting type 2 or I don't know if it's type 2 or type 1 diabetes. There's metabolic issues around this disease, type 2. The flu doesn't cause that. We've got to disentangle these things. People are thinking it's like the flu. It is not the flu long hauler disease, even among some of the young people, these athletes who think they're invincible. I used to do that. I used to think I was invincible too. This could completely change the trajectory of your career. If you have long hauler disease, we're not talking about that. We're not hearing those people's voices. I think that would help make a difference. Mike, did you want to comment? Yeah, no, I, I think one of the challenges we have today is understanding that this is a totally unprecedented time for introducing a vaccine. And what I mean by that is we have no real good history. If you look at all the other immunizations that we now routinely use, it took years and years for those vaccines to be studied, to be approved, and then roll out programs. Uh, you know, clearly we understand that HPV has been one of the more controversial ones because it involves sex uh, and a virus. But if you look at it, nothing clo it comes close to comparing to the challenges we've had because so much about what we're talking about the vaccine's only a part of the issue it's ideology it's about us versus them and we are using the same old tools to deal with what we did deal with in, in immunizations and childhood immunizations we need new tools we need to think about it differently we need to think about outreach 
You know, we've heard a lot in the last year about health disparities, and we should. We should. This is critical. But, you know, one of the things that we never really dealt with in health disparities as a systematic uh, racism issue was vaccines. You know, we, we, we've known for a long time that we've had more challenges in this country getting vaccines into certain communities than others. And I think this is all coming to roost right now at a time when we are still trying to use the same old tools that we've always had. And that's where I come back to, I'll take whatever tool works to get more people vaccinated. That's where I'm at. And, and I think that that's ultimately where most of us hopefully will end up is to say, we'll do whatever it takes. And I think that that's been the challenge because the convenient button is to just go back and hit mandate. And that somehow solves it all. That may have been a largely good solution in previous situations there's challenges to why it is now. Okay. So we've got a whole bunch of questions <laughs> from people saying, I'm here, I'm on the ground. It's July. I'm about to go back to the classroom as a student, as a faculty member, about to go back on campus into my workplace, into my cubicle, in my, you know, large room with other people. And at least here at the University of Minnesota, we do not have a vaccine mandate. So I'm going to start with you, Mike, on this. People mm -hmm. are worried and they want to know what can I do? What steps can I take that will reduce my risk? Can I talk to other people and, and just volunteer? Well, I, I, um, got vaccinated and, and let them volunteer or not, whether they did or not. Should they go back to masking? They, they're seeking advice. First and foremost, get vaccinated yourself. That is the most important thing you can do. Number two is within the context of further protection, use effective respiratory protection. That is an N95. Have it face fitted. You can get that done at Boynton Health Service now at the University of Minnesota. And unlike a year ago, when we had a very limited supply of N95 respirators, or for many who don't understand, that's what this face fitting mask is like. Use that. That is by far that combination. You want to talk to your colleagues and friends? That's fine. I mean, do it. I don't know what it buys you in the sense that. There's no guarantee that they will be truthful or untruthful. You know, you, you're still on your own. There is no way right now for anyone to actually know who's been vaccinated, who's not. And I think we just have to be honest about that. We would like to think most people will be honest about it. But if it is, in fact, are you not going to teach your class if, in fact, there's someone who is not vaccinated in your class? How are you going to teach your class differently? I don't think so. I think it's right now the standard is be vaccinated and use respiratory protection uh, that's effective. Larry, we have a question that will probably uh, warm your heart. People <laughs> saying, why are we spending all this time talking about the vulnerability of students and faculty and staff members in US healthcare, US uh, higher ed, mm -hmm. And the world is on fire, the rest of the world, that we should really shift our priorities. Um, forget this issue here in the US. Uh, we've got to deal with global health inequities. Well, it does warm my heart. I mean, it do, of course, you know, just to be fair and put my, speak with my head rather than my heart. Um, they're not mutually exclusive. We can, we can have a safe campus environment in the United States and do the right thing globally. Uh, I do believe that uh, the, 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 the situation of inequity globally with COVID, not just with vaccines, but particularly with vaccines um, is one of the greatest moral failures of, of my lifetime. Um, the United States ha has not done enough. Um, it's, do it's, it's done more than most other countries have, but it's not done anywhere near enough. Right now, 
um, in sub-Saharan Africa, or many, all, virtually all low and middle income countries, certainly low income countries, you know, about 1% of the, mm -hmm. the population is vaccinated. M the vast majority of health workers and care workers are not vaccinated. Um, meanwhile, the United States is sitting on a surplus. Um, we're talking about boosters. Um, we're vaccinating uh, all of our young population who are not as vulnerable. And I think our priorities, you know, we don't have our heads screwed on right. Um, so I don't know if I was too diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> but let me build on that and, and just ask you a comment on one other international question that's come in. Our university colleges, of course, are international crossroads. We are my We all have colleagues and students from all, and visitors and collaborators all over the world. So do you know, Larry, those universities that are embracing vaccine mandates, how are they uh, treating vaccines not approved within the US? But yeah, I know what you're saying. I, I've been advising our university on this. I'll tell you what we're doing. Um, I think it's pretty sensible. Um, so basically you have, you have three choices. Um, take, take any vaccine as a qualifying vaccine bad idea. Um, you know, there, the, some of the Chinese vaccines, the, the Russian Sputnik vaccine, um, I'm, I'm not sure I trust. Yeah. Um, the second is to just have USDA approved vaccines. Um, but that was a little bit unsatisfying to us. And so what we did is we used all vaccines, either US FDA approved, or authorized, or under an emergency use author is, or under a emergency use listing of the World Health Organization. But then we got thrown a softball, and it's curveball because it turns out that for some reason WHO is has uh, authorized the, you know two of the major Chinese vaccines that haven't shown great effectiveness. So what we've done there with our Chinese students um, is to offer them a, uh, an mRNA vaccine uh, when they come. Uh, but we need data. I'd love to have CDC tell us a little bit more about mixing vaccines. We think our clinicians think it's safe and it would be effective. Um, we've seen some studies with, with um, AstraZeneca and other vaccines mixed, but we need, we need more guidance on that. Okay, we're coming to the end, lightning round. I'm gonna start with you, Dr. T. For each of you, the single most important thing our universities and colleges should be doing right now. Dr. T. I think that we should make a commitment to address the issues and concerns coming from the communities living in the shadow of our buildings. That, that we have to take the technology and resources we have and, and in a sense, democratize them more in the, in the neighborhoods and communities. Why do we have so many people who can't get online? Why are we having so many people who are having internet issues? We put a life-saving vaccine at the end of the internet and did not assure that people had access. Pandemic has exposed all this. What are we gonna do about that? Universities have a role to play. I think that's part of it. Great, Larry. I mean, I would just be two things. I mean, one is I do think equity and, and, and having meaningful conversations with our entire community, including staff, is, and, and having an obligation to our communities because many of us live in urban communities that, that, that really need to, uh, to be engaged. Um, and then secondly is just to actually um, it's your, it's your responsibility to make sure that if you're going to be hosting a, a, a full a fall agenda, that you have to keep people safe. And you just have to demonstrate that you're doing everything that you can to keep us safe and secure. I don't want our universities to be amplifiers of this pandemic. Okay, Mike. Well, first of all, I just want to thank both of the uh, speakers today with us here. Uh, it's been wonderful to be with you. And I think uh, hopefully everyone can see the model of we are all on the same team. 
We're just trying to figure out the best methods to approach it. I think right. that's what's important. I would say that right now the university should do everything they possibly can to get as many people vaccinated as possible. Whatever outreach, whatever efforts they need for access, anything that is critical to being a barrier in that process of getting people vaccinated needs to be addressed head on. And uh, to me, we, we have a moral and I think a, a general obligation to make that happen. Wonderful. What a great, great conversation this has been. Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you for great questions. Uh -huh. uh, archived all of them anonymously and, and shared them with our speakers. Um, please give us your evaluation. We really hang on every thought you have. Uh, stay tuned for news of our next COVID controversy and please share our video uh, within your network with your colleagues. Use it to teach, use it to catalyze more debate, more conversation. Thank you for being part of today. Bye-bye. <laughs>